All right. Well, welcome in, everyone. I have a very, very special guest with me today. He's an eight-year NBA veteran, two of which he played with the Chicago Bulls during the height of the D. Rose Bulls era. He's part of the famous bench mob, as we used to call them, and now currently works for his alma mater in recruiting at the University of Arkansas for the men's basketball team. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce to you Ronnie Brewer. Ronnie, thanks for being on the show, man. Hey, thank you much, so much for having me. How are of you? Course. <laughs> so, uh, Ronnie, I do have to say this is really an honor for me to be able to talk to an NBA veteran who was part of one of the most exciting Bulls teams that we've really seen uh, since the dynasty days. So I really do appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Uh, and we'll talk about your time with the Bulls since I know that that's what my audience is really curious about most. But I do have to ask because it's always a dream of so many kids you know, to make it to the NBA. And of course, only a small fraction of them actually do end up making it. What was it like for you to take your first steps onto the court in an NBA game and you realize I've made it, I've made it to the NBA? I mean, it was a dream come true. Um, you know, I can remember like it was just yesterday. Uh, you know, it was crazy because our first game was against the Houston Rockets. They had Trace McGrady. And I can remember years prior to this, uh, <clears throat> when I was going through you know, high school getting recruited. Uh, Billy Donovan came to my game. We were playing in Orlando. Mike Miller was with him, and so was Trace McGrady. And I, I remember getting an autograph from Trace McGrady, taking a picture with both those guys um, <laughs> at AU Nationals. And, you know, fast forward uh, a few years, and, you know, my first game in the NBA, I'm, I'm playing against one of my idols, Trace McGrady. So it was definitely full circle. And, you know, it was totally a dream come true. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, I've arrived on the scene. Yeah. No, I can only imagine. I mean, I, uh, you know, as a little kid, I always thought that I was going to make it to the NBA, you know, like every other kid. And then you realize you get to about, I don't know, fifth, sixth grade. And you're like, yeah, this isn't going to happen. I'm definitely not good enough to make it to the NBA. But so to be in your shoes, to actually be able to get that far um, is incredible. But let's talk about your time with the Bulls. Uh, so you signed with the Bulls as a free agent that summer of 2010, uh, the same year the Bulls signed Carlos Boozer, Kyle Korver. Uh, the Bulls brought in a new coach, first time head coach, actually, Tom Thibodeau. Uh, and of course, in that very first season, the Bulls broke out and finished with the best record in the NBA. Rose broke out into a superstar, won the MVP. What was it like playing alongside one of the best up and coming players in the league at the time in Rose and getting to see his electric energy just every night um you know uh we, we all took a jump uh, of faith leap of faith uh coming to chicago and like you said new coach uh that wouldn't necessarily be building but there was a lot of moving parts uh you know the only people from that core group of of, of chicago bulls were you know d rose joe king Ruah Dean, uh and taj gibson and, and from those those four, we kind of built around those guys. Uh, the, you know, like you said, myself, Booz and Kyle Corver came, and C.J. Watson was a great addition. Scalabrini and Curry Thomas and uh, Omera Seek. I mean, you can go down the list, and, and you know, we had so many guys that would step in and contribute. And you know, you know, playing for a guy like Tom Thibodeau, he was a blessing for me in my career, just because you know, coming from you know the great late Jerry Sloan, rest in peace, straight to go play for, you know, Tom Thibodeau, you know, were two phenomenal back-to-back -back coaches that I had. And you know, everybody bought in and, and, and it was basically all for the team and all about yeah. winning. And I, I think that's allowed us to gel so well uh, cohesively as a unit and, and made it so good offensively and defensively as a team. Yeah, and you mentioned Tibbs. I'm actually really curious about, you know, uh, what was it like playing for for Tom Thibodeau? Because you know, we hear all of these stories from the media, you know, that Tibbs is a, a drill sergeant type coach, works you to death in practice, swears a ton in practice and in games, always standing and, you know, challenging calls made by the refs, which let me be clear, I love Tibbs. I loved it when he coached the Bulls. I was so upset when they, you know, this to, to move on from him. Um, but how is Tibbs, you know, how he's currently portrayed in the media, you know, people who haven't really ever played for him, is it really true? You know, what was he like playing for him? And I'm sure, you know, he loved guys like you, energizers, you know, high uh, defensive players. Um, did you enjoy your time period with him? And what was it like overall? I, I really enjoyed playing for Coach Thibodeau. 
Um, you know, being on the team, you know, you hear people, oh, well, you know, he, he, he practices them too hard or he's too hard on them in, in, in the games or he wears them down. But for a lot of us, you know, we, we were all judge our dogs. You know, we, we yeah. had a great grind to get, get to where we got. You know what I'm saying? D. Rose is a dog. You know, he's played with passion and, and, and was a hard worker. You know, Joe King, Bulls, Dwell Ding, you know, Keith Bogans, myself, Kyle, you know, Taj, Amir, CJ. I mean, you can go down the list of guys. Like, we were all tough nosed guys. And, you yeah. know, we mixed it up. And, um, you know, for, for him, like, we really bought into everything he was saying. It, it wasn't like, you know, we we weren't too good. We weren't um, like thinking that we were bigger and better than everybody. But you know, whatever he said, that we we bought into it, and we worked to the best of our ability to to each and every night go out there and perform at a high level. Um, and I think we did we did that. Yeah, no, and, and I'm wondering. I mean, was it hard for a first time head coach? I mean, you guys absolutely bought in, right? Was it? Yeah. Um, is that make it more challenging when when it's like this guy's never coached? I mean, he was a coach, right? He'd been with the NBA for a long time as an assistant coach, yeah. but his first time being a head coach, you know, do you kind of have to gain that trust and respect for him, or just right away you knew like this guy knows what he's doing, and we love playing for him? I mean. We, we we all knew basketball and you know it, it doesn't matter if he if he that wasn't a head coach or not you know whenever you had you know you got guys like patrick ewing and Yao Ming and kg and you know all these guys that respect him so much for for him as a coach and their development and their guidance and you know their work ethic we we would always be like, man, who are we not not to trust in Tibbs, and not sure. to not to believe everything he says? You know, it it <clears throat> it doesn't make a lot of sense to not do it. And so we 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 bought into everything he was saying. We 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 trusted him. We you know we we played as hard as we possibly could, night in night out, um, and you know it. It, it made a difference. That's what I think. That's why we our record was what it was. Yeah, and um, why we had so much success. So during so during those two years that you were with the Bulls, you know, obviously a very fun and exciting team. As I mentioned, it was exciting for us fans to watch you guys on a nightly basis. But I'm curious to know, you know, how were you guys off of the court as a team? Were you guys close? What part of the it was that part of the reason that made you guys so good as a team was because of the you know the camaraderie, the bonding relationship that you guys had not only on the court but off the court as well. I, I think so. I, I think that you know, in professional ranks, you can you know you can get some. Sometimes you can get some, like a like some bad team chemistry. It, it, right. You know, if it's you know guys getting too many shots or playing time or you know salary issues or or you know maybe not liking the coach. We we, we didn't have those situations. We we had uh, a team that ultimately really enjoyed being around each other. We 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 were we were like brothers because you know we would go into battle together and we we won together and we lost together so the the team bond relationship and the chemistry was there um, and you know off the court we we had the same brotherhood you know we we'd go out to eat together we'd go to the movies together um, you know we'd go to other sporting events together so um, we we really liked each other and I think that you could tell in the court that. You know, not only were we winning, but we were having fun while we were winning. Yeah. You know, we were out working and we were holding each other accountable. You know, if the guy wasn't diving on the floor for a loose ball, you know, we would let them let them know. And not to like like cuss or call them out or anything like that. It was just like, hey man, like we're I'm holding you to a higher standard. And yeah. I felt like, you know, D Rose wanted to win so bad for the city. You know, being from Chicago, he wanted to win so bad that everybody on our team matches intensity night in, night out. You know, we, we owed it to him to play as hard as we possibly can uh, to try to get him close to, to his goal. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys were all in it together, right? You have to hold each other accountable. I think that that's one of the things I loved about that team is that uh, you don't really see that much anymore. The, the, the energy and the hustle on a nightly basis. It's like, cause you, you guys as a team were not at least that first year, right? You weren't expected to finish with the best record in the league. Like no one was thinking that the bulls were going to finish with the best record in the league. You know, after they missed on LeBron James, Dwayne Wade is sort of those big free agency prizes of that year. Um, and then you guys dominated, right? And it's like, um, you know, I, I, you just don't see that kind of thing anymore. And I think a lot of that had to do with the energy um, that you guys brought on the court. Um, yeah. Was there a particular player or players that you were maybe closest to in those years talking about, you know, guys, uh, uh, you know, off the court? Um, I think I was always close to booze and Kyle cause we played so long together um, in Utah. Right. And in Chicago, I, I think I got really close to Lou thing, and then we got Jimmy Butler and you know uh, Keith Bogus and Rip Hamilton, just because those are our 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 position coach and you know our attention to detail and film. We were always together, um, but I think we all we all built a crazy bond together with like Joe Keem and 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 Taj and Booz and Omir especially for me because, you know, those are the guys I had to trust to call off the pick and rolls, call off the defensive coverages. And we had to have, uh, um, to, we had to gel together to make it work and be successful. So, you know, all those guys, I think I had a really good bond with because, you know, we, we had to have a relationship to trust each other. And, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you got to tell him the court. Yeah, no, for sure. So it, it pains me to talk about this topic, but I got to address it because even I myself, I can't go back and watch the footage of it even to this day. But in your second season with the Bulls, there were really high hopes that the team was going to be competing for a championship, coming back stronger than the mm -hmm. prior season in which, uh, you know, we lost in the Eastern Conference Finals to the Heat. You guys dominate yet again, finish with the best record in the league. And then in game one, the first round, Derrick Rose goes down with the ACL injury. I think deep down, we all knew, uh, but we didn't want to accept the fact, right, that the title hopes were out the window. What was it like for you seeing Rose go down? And how much of a blow was it to the team? You know, what was the feeling or atmosphere like in the locker room after the game had finished? Because yeah. you, guys had, you guys had actually won the game, right? But I'm sure yeah. it couldn't have been a positive win after what you just saw. I mean, it, it like somebody took the wind out of our sails. Yeah. I mean, D Rose was like the motor to uh, a luxury car. I mean, he kind of got us to go and, and get us from point A to point B. And we were like the body to help just facilitate and take the blows and and be there um, and assist him um, when need be. And, you know, when he went down, I mean, you know, the, the United Center was, you know, eerily, eerie quiet. And I remember him coming off the floor and, and, you know, you know, we were just hoping for the best, like, oh man, it's hopefully he just has a knee sprain or he bumped knees or, 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 you know, twisted it or, or, or whatnot, not, yeah. you know, anything worse than that. And then, you know, he's in the back and we come in the locker room and you got the whole front office and the owner back there and, You've got his his family back there and um, in the training room, so we couldn't really see too much. Um, and then they ended up going to get an MRI, so we were kind of out of the loop. But it was kind of crazy because we have such good team chemistry and such a team bond. Like after the game, we all went out to eat together, and so we were all together. Every single person on our team was together. Yeah, and we all got the news at the same time from our trainer that, you know, um, you know, D Rose will be out for the season, um, when he tore an ACL and it was kind of like a, 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 a gut punch that, yeah. that we all took. Um, and it, and it, it's no disrespect to, you know, TJ Watson or any of our backup guards. You know, yeah. I, I felt like throughout the year, D Rose was had, you know, some small, um, bumps and bruises and those other guys stepped right in and played, phenomenally well and kept us afloat. Um, but deep down inside, we knew that those guys weren't D-Rose and D-Rose, 
you know, in all reality, made you carry yourself with a certain, um, you know, swag, certain yeah. confidence that that these guys were, you know, no matter who we play, we're going to be in any game um, because we like the matchups that we have. So it's a little bit yeah, different. It, it, it's I like that you mentioned that too because I mean I, I remember that you know that second season when you were with the Bulls, uh, the year that Rose ended up going down. I mean he he'd actually had a few minor injuries throughout the season, but the team still did incredibly well. Um, mm-hmm. But you're right. I think it's different when you know that it's a season ending injury it happens in the playoffs and you know that he's going to be out for a long time because that, like you said, it was, it was a gut check to fans. I'm sure for players, he was even more so uh, to just be like, uh, like, where do we go from here? You know what I mean? And obviously it was you know more painful because then he continued to have uh, further injuries after that. But um, it still didn't take away from, at least for me anyway, as a fan, the fact that those were two incredible seasons and we just really haven't, you know, seen much of that from the Bulls really ever since. But I, I do you think that had Rose not gotten injured, it's it's sort of the the age old what if question. Had he not gotten injured, which effectively changed the trajectory of his career and franchise, do you think that you guys would have won the title that year in 2012 and taken out the Miami Heat? Well, I, I think the, our first year uh, they were a little bit more experienced. They, they were more right. veteran savvy than us. Right. Um, and you know we 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 dropped some games, made some play, you know, didn't make some plays down the stretch when we should have, and they ended up winning the game. Uh, you know, kudos to you, tip your hat to them. But we we really truly felt that that next year, you know, we had more than enough to go compete at a high level uh, and win a championship. We we were we were more seasoned, we were more experienced, and you know, we all thought we would have been in a situation to be able to knock knock them off. So. It's unfortunate that we it didn't get there. It's unfortunate that he came up, you know, we came up short and he got injured. But, you know, I wouldn't change anything in the world because, I, you know, stuff that we experienced that year, I think it just made us stronger and cohesively as a group. It united us that, you know, we were trying to go through so many barriers, you know, coming being number one <clears throat> and not being the favorite. We had to prove everybody every night that we were deserving of – you know, having one of the better records. And so right. it, I think it just made us better as a team. And, you know, unfortunately, we, we just didn't get it done. Now, I also have to ask, you know, you know just because uh, he's one of my favorite players of all time and Joakim Noah, what was it like playing alongside him? You know, was his infectious energy and that grit contagious to where it would rub off on you guys? Was he, you know, one of those guys in practice that you mentioned either, where he would get on you, right, if you weren't working as hard as he was? Um, you were also one of those high energy guys. Uh, and, and so wondering what it was like, you know, just playing alongside him and having fun with him. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Joe Keen was one of my favorite, favorite teammates to play with uh, while playing the NBA. Um, you know, his communication was phenomenal as a, as a post player. His, his, his basketball savvy, his basketball IQ was one of the better in the NBA. And <clears throat> his energy, like you said, was infectious, you know, um, you know, we were if we were going through the motions offensively, he'd make a you know great you know dribble handoff or backdoor cut, and finding his teammates for a layup. He would find me a lot of times for easy buckets, uh, and then he would make plays on the defensive end, uh, right. and would get us going and get the crowd going. So <clears throat> I think he's one of the most underrated players you know at his position and while he was playing because you know people always found something to hate on him. While he was playing, if it was a shot, if it was attitude, if it was hair, being in the <laughs> bun, uh, if Sim talk of trash, there was always a negative. And nobody really praised him and yeah. respected the things that he did. You know, he's averaging a double double. You know, <clears throat> he's getting his hands were active, getting steals, getting blocks, assists. And you know, I always tell people this as a as a as a player, as a basketball player, and a, and a person who's known to, to to be able to be a lockdown defender. You know, if your bigs can talk and communicate, you know, it makes the game so much easier, you know, on a guard. And he was one of the best communicators I played with. You know, Rashid Wallace is another one that's yeah. phenomenal at communicating. Kevin Garnett's another one that's, you know, phenomenal at communicating. But, you know, the great defensive players that are bigs, they talk and communicate and, and um, you know, they're early, loud, and continuous on their talk to help the guards out. And, I think that's what allowed us to have, be one of the better defense 
for defensive efficient teams in the NBA. Yeah, when well, I mean, you talk about Joakim and his communication, you know, when when Rose went down, he sort of stepped up and became that playmaker, if you will, right? Like he started he started yeah. dishing out more assists, and I mean, he was always known for being a really good communicator, a great passer, for being a big man. Um, now I'll I'll end with this because I'm sure my audience is probably more curious to know your thoughts uh, on this Bulls season. And if you haven't really been following, uh, sorry, this off season, I should say, if you haven't really been following the Bulls in their off season, that's totally fine as well. I know you're focusing on college basketball and recruiting players, but uh, what are your thoughts on the moves that the Bulls made this off season? Bringing in guys like Lonzo Ball, Mar DeRozan, play alongside Zach Levine, Nikola Vucevic. How do you see the Bulls faring this season in a competitive uh, Eastern Conference? I think they'll be way more improved. Uh, I, you know, I think they have some good young pieces. I think they move some pieces around, but they'll you know, bring in Lonzo Ball and DeRozan, uh, the team of the, the core guys they've got there already, already makes them uh, a, a more better and a more complete team that they've had been in years. So I like the direction that the front office is going with. I think the fans should be happy with the front office uh, and the move that they're making. Uh, and I think <clears throat> long term, I think it's going to pay off. I, I think, you know, when these guys, um, how quickly um, their chemistry builds and gels together, I think you'll start seeing a, a really, really w- very competitive um, Chicago Bulls team with the pieces they added. For sure. I, I know I said that was the last one, but you started talking about front office, and I'm just curious, what was it like uh playing for the old front office, you know, Gar Foreman and John Paxson. Um, you know, they, they obviously get a lot of hate from from Bulls fans, but I'm curious to know from a player's perspective, you know, what was it what was it like? Maybe, you know, were they were they maybe hated on a little too much um that they probably should have been given from fans? Well, I mean I, I'm a I'm a sound like a hypocrite, but I, I thought they did a phenomenal job uh orchestrating and putting together putting together um the team that we had, um, you know, we, we were the number one team in the East back to back years. So, you know, we, we had a great team, very competitive, obviously two rows got hurt, but you know, we still were super, super competitive. Yeah. You know, D rose being hurt, you add another guard. Um, and, and we're right back in the mix, but you know, I, I thought it was very poor decision from the front, front office to, to break up that team. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, D Rose went down, but you, you had a young Jimmy Butler, and and and, a, and you had a core group of guys that obviously went, you know, best record in the in the East two back to back years. Um, without and obviously we didn't win a championship, but we were cl- we were right there. And yeah. uh, I, I just wish that they would have stuck a little bit longer with 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 everybody um, to see how it would play out, and um, you know, if we can get back to 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 the Eastern Conference Finals, but, you know, unfortunately that didn't happen. And, you know, obviously I'm in the front office, but uh, I think we owed it to, you know, D Rose and we owed it to Chicago fans to see where, see where this went instead of going the direction that he did. So, yeah, but I, but I like the new front office. I think that they're, they're like, they're investing in the, in the team they're, and they're showing the fans that, that they're trying to win now. So, you know, Bulls fans should be very happy in the direction the team is going. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's always, it's easy to say in hindsight that, oh, like Gar Pax, they were terrible because, you know, they, they broke, they traded Jimmy Butler away. They traded Derrick Rose away. Um, You know, things didn't work out in the years, you know, when you were on the team and it's like, well, you know, certain circumstances do happen. Like Derrick Rose getting injured. That's not something they have control over. Um, You know, so, you know, I think every front office, it's always hard to construct a really competitive team, let alone a championship team. Only one team in the entire league of 30 teams can actually win a championship. So I, I, you know, I am always, I'm, I've been hard myself on guard packs as well, and I'm definitely happy with the new front office. Um, but I do think that they probably get maybe a little more criticism than they, than they probably deserve. Um, Ronnie, I really do appreciate the time I'm in. I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to be on the show. Best of luck to you uh, and the Razorbacks in their upcoming season. And, uh, yeah, let's stay in touch, man. Man, I really appreciate I appreciate you having me. And, you know, if you ever need me, just reach out. Uh, and I'm always here to talk. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Ronnie. Take care, buddy.